This is Red Bay, Labrador. Today, it's a tiny village of fewer than 200 people, tucked away in a natural harbor surrounded by the red granite cliffs that give it its name. At first glance, it's what you might expect from a small northern fishing town. But if you know where to look, you'll find clues from its past. Hints that this quiet hamlet was once a very different place. These giant bones have been resting here for nearly 500 years, since the days when Red Bay was a bustling commercial hub that launched one of the world's most gruesome industries. These bones are whale bones. They belong to the titanic creatures who were hunted here centuries ago. They were left behind by some of the very first Europeans ever to visit the place we now call Canada. And they're connected to one of the most bizarre heists in Canadian history. This is the story of the stolen whale of Red Bay. This is Canadiana. The year is 1575. Elizabeth I sits on the English throne. The Black Death ravages Venice. Shakespeare is still a boy, yet to write a single play. And here on the shores of Labrador, a crew of Basque sailors is on the hunt for a whale. The Basques are one of Europe's oldest cultures. They've been living on what's now the border between France and Spain for thousands of years, long before those countries existed. By the 1500s, they'd already been hunting whales for centuries. And when Europeans became aware of the vast continent to their west for the first time since the days of the Vikings, the Basques were among the first to strike out across the Atlantic. Every spring, more than a thousand whalers would set sail from the Basque country to some of the richest whaling grounds on the planet. This is the Strait of Belle Isle, a thin strip of water between Newfoundland and Labrador. 500 years ago, it was filled with whales. They migrated through in vast numbers every summer and winter. To the north, the Thule ancestors of the Inuit had been sustainably hunting whales for thousands of years. But when the Basques began arriving in the early 1500s, the newcomers were determined to carry it out on a much bigger scale. In the decades to come, they would brave raging storms, fight off pirates, and trade with indigenous nations as they worked to establish a significant presence in these waters and they would succeed. The Basques built a whole series of ports along the Strait of Belle Isle. The biggest of them all was here at Red Bay. This is where Captain Juan Lopez de Jesus was based and where one November day, his men climbed into their small boats as they rowed out in search of one of the world's most lucrative quarries. Whales were a gold mine. They were used to make all kinds of products. The baleen was turned into whalebone corsets, collars, umbrellas, and countless other daily items. But in those early days, what the Basques were really after was the blubber. It could be rendered down into whale oil, used to make candles, soap, paint, and most important of all, light. Whale oil made a long-burning fuel used in lamps for 300 years. A longer period than kerosene, longer than we've even had light bulbs. The light it cast helped drive the Industrial Revolution. Strong and bright enough to allow people to work deep into the night. Five centuries later, you can still find evidence of it here at Red Bay. These clay roof tiles are hundreds of years old. They're from the ovens the Basques used to boil the whale blubber down into oil. 
burning night and day, filthy and disgusting work that turned a tidy profit. One really big whale could produce a hundred barrels of oil, the season's wages for more than a dozen men. And Red Bay was producing much more than that. Thousands of barrels were shipped off every year, with thousands more coming from the other neighboring ports. It was the first time in history that whaling was carried out on an industrial scale. The whale business was big business. There were fortunes to be made here in Labrador, and fortunes to be lost. Captain Rizou's men found the gargantuan prey they were looking for on that November day in 1575. A bowhead whale, one of the most impressive animals on Earth. Bowheads may very well be the longest living mammal. Some live for more than 200 years. They can grow to be twice as long as a bus and weigh more than an airplane and they're incredibly strong, with heads powerful enough to smash through the thick sea ice of the Arctic. They were not easy to kill. It took Captain Rizou's men all day to chase their prey down. Launching their harpoons into her flesh before finishing her off with their lances. It wasn't until the very end of the day that they won their hard-fought prize. But by then, the sky was growing dark. There wasn't enough time for the Basques to tow the massive carcass home to Red Bay. So they decided to leave it at a nearby cove. They tied the great beast up as securely as they could and then rushed back home before night descended. But when they came back later to claim their prize, they discovered the whale was gone. More than 450 years later, we still don't know all the details of what happened, but we do know that the missing whale soon turned up in the possession of another bass captain, Nicolas de la Torre. Captain Rezu was furious. He was sure he'd been robbed. Torre's men must have been lying in wait while Rezu's men tied the whale up or stumbled across it and stolen it for themselves. The accusation sparked an epic court battle. While Captain Rezu demanded compensation, Tori claimed the whale had slipped free of its ropes. He said his men had found it floating loose in the strait and that he was well within his rights to claim it. The court case dragged on for nearly 20 years, going all the way up to the Spanish Supreme Court. The disputes of Labrador settled by judges thousands of kilometers away. The case went on for so long that by the time a decision was finally handed down, both the captains were already dead. Rezu had come to a bitter end. His ship was requisitioned by the king. Instead of sailing to Red Bay for another season of whaling, it was sent off to war as part of the Spanish Armada's doomed invasion of England. Its captain didn't live to see that defeat. And so it was left to the rival's widows to carry on the feud. It wasn't until 1593 that the court made its decision. It declared the whale had indeed been stolen. Today, no one's entirely sure if Captain Rezu's wife ever got the 60 barrels of oil she was granted, but the case of Red Bay's infamous whale heist was finally closed. By then, the seeds of Red Bay's decline had already been sown. Pirate attacks were becoming more common. There were violent clashes with the Inuit, and Rezu was far from the only Basque captain to lose his ship to the Spanish Armada. But most telling, the whales were disappearing. They were overhunted to such an extent that today you'll find no bowhead swimming through these waters at all. And so, after a century in Labrador, many Basques stopped sailing for the Strait of Belle Isle. Red Bay fell into ruin. And the memory of its time at the center of the world's whaling industry was gradually erased nearly lost forever.
There were clues, though. Some scattered documents preserved in Spanish archives, mysterious red tiles washing up on the shore, a shipwreck hidden beneath the waves, and the bones of the whales bleaching on the beach. It wasn't until the 1970s that a Canadian historian, Dr. Salma Barkham, began putting the pieces together, digging through archives in the earth. And after 400 years, the stories of Red Bay came to life once again. Tales of great aquatic beasts, the lives of the whalers who hunted them, and one truly bizarre heist. The case of the stolen whale is not the only incredible story dug up by Dr. Barkham's research. On an island in Red Bay, a team of archaeologists later uncovered remnants of another, slightly grislier tale of greed. I will tell you that story in a second. But first, I just wanted to quickly thank you so much for watching. I'm Ashley Brooke, the series producer and one of just two filmmakers behind the making of Canadiana. You won't normally see Kyle or myself in front of the camera but we've gained quite a few new subscribers and Patreon supporters since our last episode. And so on behalf of Adam, Kyle, and myself, thank you so much for supporting this series. We have lots more stories to share, but to do that, we do need your help. Making these videos is a ton of work, especially the editing and animation. And we're just two people trying to manage it all from research to visual effects, sound design, and everything in between which is why we can't always release episodes as often as we'd like. If you're able, you can support Canadiana on Patreon. There's a link in the description below. And if enough join, even just a few dollars per month can help us continue to make the best videos that we can. Or you can make a one-time donation through our PayPal link. If you liked this episode, you'll probably be interested in our other episodes. We've covered everything from Newfoundland dogs to the Alaska Highway, so be sure to check those out too. Back to Red Bay. On Saddle Island, a team of archaeologists uncovered remnants of another tale of greed. Normally, galleons of Basque whalers would return to the Basque country pretty much as soon as their cargoes were full. If they were lucky, they would have enough barrels to head home by the end of summer, but more often they would end up staying through the fall migration to make as much money as they possibly could. That's when things got hairy. Those in charge of making the call would often push their departures as late as December. On at least three occasions, that decision proved deadly. December 1576, a rapid onset of ice trapped the remaining galleons from at least three ports, forcing their men to spend the entire winter in Labrador. Winters in Labrador were brutal and the whalers were far from prepared. Today, temperatures are known to plummet below negative 30 degrees Celsius. But back then, they may have been even colder. It was during a period known as the Little Ice Age. When the ships froze in their icy ports, they would freeze to death in the frigid temperatures. Some might have starved, or more likely, they died slowly from scurvy. And they may have been laid to rest on Saddle Island. The remains of more than 130 bodies were uncovered there in 1982. All men between the age of 20 and 40, though two may have been as young as 12. Those unlucky enough to have suffered the terrible winter in Red Bay were likely among those discoveries. Preserved just beneath the surface, their stories forgotten for over 400 years, only to be uncovered by one intrepid researcher in a dusty corner of an archive, half a world away. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on Canadiana.